Certainly the church refuses to accept same-sex marriage. It won't even bless same-sex relationships. It will bless dogs and cats, warships and tanks, but it won't bless loving same-sex couples. You're listening to episode 53 of the National Secular Society podcast produced by Emma Park. It is hard to think that merely 55 years ago, having a love affair with someone of the same sex as yourself was a criminal offence, or that the age of consent for gay sex was only reduced to 16 in 2001, or that same-sex marriage was only permitted by law in England, Wales and Scotland in 2014, and in Northern Ireland not till last year. The history of LGBT rights in the UK has involved persistent struggles against prejudice and entrenched views. In wider society, attitudes to sexualities other than heterosexuality have shifted over the last five decades. Throughout this time, however, and indeed for centuries before that, it has always been religious organisations of one sort or another that have led the opposition to greater equality. In this episode, I'm very pleased to welcome two seasoned LGBT activists to talk about their experiences over the years. My first guest, Peter Tatchell, has been campaigning for gay rights and public acceptance since 1967. During that time, he has suffered numerous violent assaults, arrests, attacks on his home, and death threats. Since 2011, he has directed the Peter Tatchell Foundation, which campaigns for human rights around the world. His story has been told in the documentary Hating Peter Tatchell, released this year on Netflix. I will be talking to Peter about what it was like to be gay in Britain in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and about some of his most memorable campaigns. We will also be discussing the extent to which different religious organisations continue to oppose LGBT equality today, both in Britain and around the world. My second guest, Terry Sanderson, started campaigning for gay rights just two years after Peter Tatchell in 1969. Terry joined the National Secular Society in the 1990s and was its president from 2006 to 2017. He will be talking to me about the resistance to LGBT equality which he has encountered from religious organisations over the years, and the continuing role of the NSS in challenging them. Finally, I will be asking Terry to what extent it is possible to be both gay and religious. Peter Tatchell, welcome to the podcast. It's a great pleasure to join you. Well, thank you for being here. So let's start with your long experience in campaigning. You've been campaigning for 54 years now. What was it like to begin in Britain when you started campaigning? Well, I think if anyone's seen the new Netflix documentary about my life, Hating Peter Tatchell, you will see that I did begin at a very, very young age when I was still at school. Um, But when I came from Australia to London in 1971, age 19, I was still a criminal. There'd been a partial limited decriminalization of male homosexuality, but only in England and Wales, not in Scotland or Northern Ireland, and only if both men were aged 21 or over. So I was still two years below the lawful age of consent, and I could face a sentence of up to two years in prison for a consenting relationship. Um, At the same time, there was very widespread police harassment of gay bars, clubs, and even private parties. Uh, There were no out public figures. The whole of society was pretty much against us. Um, The government, the judiciary, the police, the media, the education system, the church. We were really with our backs against the wall, you know, fighting for our basic fundamental human rights with every social institution ranged against us. So it was a big, big challenge. And of course, religiously motivated people were in the forefront of the attacks upon our community and the attempts to ensure that we did not get equal rights. So for decades, um, in the 1970s, 80s, and right up to the 1990s, you couldn't even get a parliamentary debate about LGBT plus equality because MPs thought it was so disgusting. And many of these MP- MPs were influenced by religion. In terms of the religious opposition so in those decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, are, are there any particular um, examples that stand out in your memory? Well, of course, one of the really big religious campaigns of the early 1970s was by Mary Whitehouse and her Festival of Light. This was a Christian-led campaign against what they called 
moral pollution. And in particular, they opposed abortion, homosexuality, and pornography. They said these were modern evils that were destroying British life, that were a threat to our civilization. And one of the things that Professor Light really opposed very strongly was any rights for LGBT plus people. Uh, some of them wanted to roll back the partial limited decriminalization of 1967. Others were egging on the police to use the remaining laws to crack down on our community with even greater ferocity. Um, there were attacks upon gay organizations like the Gay Liberation Front and the Campaign for Homosexual Equality. Uh, there were attacks on the newly formed gay media, gay news. Um, there were attacks upon uh, LGBT counseling and advice services, which they said were corrupting the nation. So it was a big, tough battle against these religious figures who had a lot of public support and a lot of political support. Lots of members of Parliament were backing the Festival of Light and the kinds of ideas that it espoused. What eventually do you think changed um, these attitudes? Was it just society in general becoming more liberal towards the 1990s and then the early 2000s? There's no doubt in my mind that it was only because of the campaigning of LGBT plus organisations and individuals that things began to change. If we just sat back and allowed straight society to walk all over us, we would have had to wait many, many more years to secure equal rights. There's a very clear correlation between the campaigns and eventual change. So, for example, in the 1990s, I was involved with the LGBT plus direct action group Outrage, and we had a series of campaigns targeting every single anti-LGBT plus law. You know, we'd go for one, then another, then another, and so on. And through our very spectacular, daring, controversial, and sometimes quite fun and entertaining protests, we got a lot of media coverage. And through this media coverage, it raised public awareness about the scale of discrimination that our community faced. So that began to build public support for change. And of course, the protests also put people in power under pressure to justify their homophobia. So, you know, the government, the media, the church were put on the back foot by our protests. You know, they were being challenged by us and by journalists to justify the homophobia that they were endorsing. And eventually, over time, many of them realized that, you know, this really wasn't a very good PR move, that, that they were losing the PR war, the public opinion was turning against them. And, and so it did. And that's why eventually politicians felt emboldened to legislate reform. You know, we would go to politicians and say, look, public opinion polls show that a majority of the public support an equal age of consent for gay and bisexual men. Public opinion shows that most people now support an end to the ban on LGBT plus people in the armed forces. And armed with that information, it gave politicians the confidence that they could reform the law. What would you say was some of the most, um, or an example of one of the most outrageous things that you did um, as part of your campaigning to raise awareness? Well, one of them was going into Canterbury Cathedral on Easter Sunday in 1998 to challenge the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. George Carey, over the fact that he wasn't merely saying that gay people were sinful and should repent. He was arguing and seeking to persuade Parliament to oppose gay equality, to support discrimination in law. That to us was so outrageous, particularly because for eight years, he refused to meet anyone from the LGBT plus community, even members of the lesbian and gay Christian movement who were part of his own Anglican church. So when the door was slammed in our face, we felt no option but to go to Canterbury Th Cathedral and call him out. Now, we didn't interrupt any sacred parts of the service, 
but when he began his uh, sermon, we did calmly walk into the pulpit, hold up placards um, highlighting different areas of law that discriminated against us, where the Archbishop supported that law and opposed its repeal. And then I delivered a very short, um, I suppose, alternative sermon, um, making the point that discrimination is not a Christian value. For our pains, uh, we were dragged out of the cathedral by the police. I was eventually charged and convicted under the Ecclesiastical Courts Jurisdiction Act 1860, formerly part of the Brawling Act of 1551, which prohibits any interruption of a minister of religion in a place of worship. It's the only instance where there is such a sweeping blanket prohibition on protests. However, the upshot of the protest was very positive. First of all, Dr. Carey dramatically reduced his advocacy of homophobic discrimination in law. Secondly, he met with the lesbian and gay Christian movement for the very first time. And thirdly, he appointed a senior bishop to begin a dialogue with the LGBT plus community. So those were three wins out of that one protest. What is the Church of England's position today on LGBT plus people? Has it improved dramatically? I would say it's improved, but probably not dramatically. Um, certainly the official position of the church is that uh, homosexuality is inferior to heterosexuality, although they don't publicly say that much anymore. Um, certainly the church um, refuses to accept same-sex marriage. It won't even bless same-sex relationships. It will bless dogs and cats, warships and tanks, but it won't bless loving same-sex couples. Um, recently, the church has spoken out to its credit against LGBT plus conversion therapy. So that is a definite movement in the right direction. Globally, the worldwide Anglican communion, as opposed to the Church of England itself, is still very, very homophobic and is, if not dominated, certainly very strongly influenced by a hardline homophobic faction around uh, GAFCON, which is an evangelical grouping within the Anglican Communion who are very much opposed to any progress on LGBT plus rights and any inclusion of LGBT plus people within the church. Uh, moreover, GAFCON actively campaigns to maintain the criminalization of same-sex relations in countries where those laws still exist and to actively attack and undermine those campaigners and politicians who seek to strive to end criminalization and to legislate equality. GAFCON, is that um, a worldwide organization? GAFCON is a right-wing evangelical faction within the worldwide Anglican communion. And it's particularly powerful and strong in the global South, in countries in Africa and Asia. Which are in any event more traditional societies where you would expect to find more prejudice against LGBT plus people? Yes, but even in these countries, there are uh, Christians who support LGBT plus rights, like uh, Bishop Christopher Sanyonjo in Uganda, he was a part of the Church of Uganda, part of the global Anglican Communion, and he was effectively expelled um, because he supported LGBT plus rights. But he is still championing the defense of our community against discrimination and hate crime at great personal risk to himself in Uganda. Within... Um the UK, we've spoken about the Church of England. What about in terms of other religious groups or, say, factions within different religious groups? To what extent do these continue to oppose equality for LGBT plus people? Well, of course, the Catholic Church is still very, very hardline against same-sex rights. Even though the Pope has tried to project a more liberal image 
on the ground in reality, uh, both he and the wider Catholic communion very much resist any advance on LGBT plus equality. And indeed, some Catholics who have championed LGBT plus rights have been forced out of the church. They've, in some cases, been excommunicated. Uh, what about other religious um, minorities within the UK? The Methodist Church in the UK has just voted to conduct same-sex marriages. They join the Scottish Episcopal Church, the Unitarians, the Quakers, and the United Reformed Church in supporting marriage equality. But the Catholic Church, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and many others, they're all absolutely still against a same-sex marriage, which strikes me as rather strange because being supporters of marriage and being supporters of love, commitment, and fidelity, you would have thought they would welcome the fact that gay people want to get married. But no, their dogma and their prejudice uh, overrides that. What about in other religions, such as um, Muslims and Hindus or, or Jewish community? To, to what extent are these different religious groups, either for or against, or, or different factions within them, um, supportive or not of, of increasing gay rights? Support for LGBT plus rights in the Jewish community was pioneered by liberal and reform synagogues, and even now embraced by some orthodox synagogues as well. But there is a hard line, um, ultra-Orthodox um, Jewish faction, which still is very, very hostile to LGBT plus rights. And in their schools and places of worship, they very strongly oppose any recognition or support for LGBT plus individuals or indeed for LGBT plus human rights in law. Uh, when it comes to Islam, um, there is basically no support of any faction in Islam for LGBT plus rights. Um, there are a handful of individual imams who do give comfort and support to LGBT plus Muslims, and one or two who have spoken out publicly for LGBT plus rights, but they are very much the exception. Nevertheless, on the ground, among ordinary Muslims, there has been quite a change in attitudes. So even though mosques and imams have not changed, a uh, lot of ordinary Muslims now would tacitly or by default support uh, the non-persecution and non-discrimination of LGBT plus people. So it's progress there, but very slow, and it's not coming from the top. The hierarchy in Islam is still very adamantly against LGBT plus rights. What do you think has brought about the change among normal Muslims and, and how um, long a time period are we talking about for these changes to have happened? Have they happened in recent years? Or? The changes within Islam have only really happened in the last 10 years or so. And I think it's partly and largely due to young Muslims. Um, who are growing up in the British education system with uh, a public media that features LGBT plus people and storylines. Um, their first-hand experience is something quite different. They don't see LGBT plus people as the demons that are portrayed by imams and orthodox Islam. Um, I think change has also happened because more and more LGBT plus Muslims have come out to their families, their neighbors, their work colleagues, and in some cases, even to their imams and fellow congregants at mosques. That's had a very powerful impact. It's forced a lot of Muslims to take cognizance of the fact that LGBT people are within their families, their communities, and their mosques. So the old hardline approach is very hard to sustain. Of course, there are some who will sustain it, um, particularly at the top. 
So, I mean, in general, would you say that um, the way forward for just ensuring that not only as a matter of law, but also in terms of public attitude in Britain being the diverse society that it is, um, in general, would you say that, you know, education, having a shared education is, is really important for, for future generations and, and changing or sort of keeping progressive attitudes in the long term? There's no doubt in my mind that having a secular education is the key to a more harmonious society, to breaking down barriers, divisions and prejudice. And the fact that a third of all schools are faith schools and that they are able to teach their own religious ethos around homosexuality and transgenderism, that is not conducive to an inclusive society. It actually fuels prejudice discrimination and the injustice that our community faces. So for me, battling against faith schools is part and parcel of the battle for LGBT plus rights. Um, we know that the government is now bringing in mandatory relationship and sex education in every school. Uh, it's gonna be compulsory, but yet again, faith schools are being given an opt-out where they will be allowed to teach relationship and sex education while also citing their own religious teachings on the issue. And so many of these uh, faith schools are from faiths that still regard homosexuality as sinful, immoral, abnormal, and unnatural. So it means that young LGBT plus kids will not get the affirmation and support they need. It means that homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia will not be fully challenged in those schools. And that will make it possible for uh, bullying and teasing and name calling and even sometimes actual physical assaults to happen in the school playground. But we know that nearly half of all young LGBT kids have been victims of bullying on account of their sexuality or their gender identity in the classroom or the playground, nearly half. And of course, in religious schools, it is worse. And in religious schools, there is less action taken to prevent it. Do you think that the direction that Britain is going today, um, where increasing restraints seem to be placed on free speech in a number of different areas, is likely to make it harder for um, the LGBT plus community to achieve full equality in the medium term future? Do you think it's more important to have the right to protest um, freely about these issues, or do you think it's more important to keep everyone safe by, by inhibiting the right to say things which some people might find offensive? I think there is a danger when attempting to protect vulnerable, marginalised communities that in the process we end up with laws that actually inhibit free speech and the right to protest. So we can see in the Scottish Hate Crimes Bill the way in which it was very, very broadly drawn. And you know, even under laws in England and Wales, you know, there have been very wide interpretations of the Public Order Act, you know, the section which prohibits uh, harassment, alarm or distress, to clamp down on perfectly peaceful, legitimate protests. You think of the example of the young guy who was arrested for holding a placard outside the Scientology headquarters with the words, Scientology is a dangerous cult. He got arrested. Um, so did a student in Oxford who joked that a policeman's horse was gay. An elderly man who put up a poster saying religions are fairy tales, got a knock on his door by the police. Now, I think that people should have a right to express their point of view. And if they are saying bigoted, offensive things, the most effective way to deal with that is by challenging them, by showing why they're wrong, by producing counter evidence and arguments. You know, the whole history of 
um, the evolution of ideas in our society is about questioning, skepticism, challenges, debates. Um, you think of some of the greatest minds in history caused great offense in their time. Galileo Galilei, Charles Darwin, uh, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx. The list is endless. Free speech is one of the most important and precious of all human rights. There have to be really strong, compelling reasons before we restrict it. Like, for example, if someone makes a false damaging allegation, saying that someone is a pedophile or a rapist, that can put their physical safety in danger from mob violence. Another example is if someone engages in persistent harassment, threats or menaces, so that someone is fearful and unable to participate in a public debate because they fear the consequences. And finally, and likewise, um, if a person incites violence, that is not free speech, it inhibits free speech, because the person against whom violence is being incited will be afraid and fearful. They will not feel able to engage in debate because they fear potential violent retribution. So those three examples, I think, are legitimate grounds for restricting free speech. But otherwise, the best way to overcome bad ideas is with better ideas. Yep. The battle for LGBT plus rights was won not by banning people or no platforming them. It was won by us engaging the bigots to show why they were wrong, to go on TV and radio, to speak out against their prejudice, to reach an audience of millions, to persuade them that the bigots were wrong. And if we don't have the confidence to challenge bigotry, to make the counter arguments, then I, I frankly despair. We, we don't deserve to win if we haven't got the confidence to stand our ground because the arguments we are making are strong, positive, and right arguments. You know, we have the arguments on our side. We can win. We just have to make those arguments. And that's how you change hearts and minds. And by changing hearts and minds, how you change politicians and persuade them to vote for equality. So in conclusion, the cause of greater equality, greater rights for LGBT people like many others is served by having a wide, wide area of free speech and only limits on it in quite um, extreme cases. Free speech means nothing if it doesn't include the right of people with whom I disagree. So I'm open to people criticizing me. That's their right. They can even do so in quite strong, robust language, providing they don't incite violence or make false damaging allegations. Uh, that's why on a number of occasions, I have defended Christian street preachers who have spoken out against homosexuality, but they haven't been threatening or abusive. They've just expressed a point of view. And I don't believe they're right, but equally, I don't believe they should be prosecuted as criminals. You know, we have to challenge them, protest against them, show why they're wrong, but criminalization is a step too far. Which side of the line would, would you put insulting on? There is no right in human rights law to not be insulted or not be offended. You know, the right to make strong, robust criticisms, to ridicule and satire other points of view. That is perfectly legitimate in a free society. I was involved with the National Secular Society in a campaign to remove the insult clause from the Public Order Act 1986. We argued that insult was too low a threshold to justify a criminal offence. We got together with a very broad coalition, including conservative MPs like Edward Lee and David Davis, with whom I do not normally agree, 
and successfully persuaded the government to repeal the insult clause from the Public Order Act. Now, that was a very significant victory for free speech. We followed up that success with a further success a short time afterwards against a government bill that sought to penalise causing nuisance or annoyance. We said these were vague, subjective terms that could be open to very wide abuse. And again, we persuaded the government to drop those clauses. And, and just finally, um, Peter, what would you say are the main obstacles that remain to um, achieving full LGBT plus equality in Britain today? We have made great progress here in Britain, but we should never forget that right up until 1999, Britain had by volume the largest number of anti-LGBT plus laws of any country in the world, some of them dating back centuries. Yet 14 years later, with the legalization of same-sex marriage in 2013, Britain had some of the best laws. That is a phenomenally successful law reform campaign. But there are still issues to fight and win. We're still battling to secure a ban on LGBT plus conversion therapy, uh, to reform the Gender Recognition Act, to give trans people the right to self-ID by statutory declaration, which exists in many other countries, and of course, to secure LGBT plus inclusive education in all our schools with no exemptions or opt-outs for faith organizations. And on all these three issues, it is religious organizations that are kicking back, trying to block progress. You know, the number one focus of resistance to LGBT plus rights in Britain and around the world is organized religion. The good news is that religion and religious influence and privilege is in decline here in Britain. And although there are some religious revivals in some other countries, overall, the global trend is towards a non-religious secular society. So I have great hope for the future. And I'll finish with my motto, which is, don't accept the world as it is, dream of what the world could be, and then help make it happen. Peter Tatchell, thank you very much. Thank you. Terry Sanderson, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me here. You've been campaigning in support of LGBT rights since 1969. What was the situation like when you were first um, campaigning? How were um, gay people perceived um, in terms of sort of general social attitudes? Well, of course, in 1969, it was only two years after the uh, law had been passed that decriminalized homosexuality to an extent, not completely, but to some degree, uh, which gave a little bit of freedom to gay people. Um, the, the hangover from the pre-1967 days when gay people were regarded quite widely as being undesirable and criminal uh, and corrupt and all the other things that that, that uh, were said about us. Uh, th those attitudes were, were a long time changing. Since then, of course, we've made a lot of progress, but it was slow and often it felt like, you know, one step forward and two steps back. But we, we here we are, we've, we've made a lot of progress. We're almost legal completely nowadays. Yeah, you mentioned that um, the 1967 law decriminalised um, homosexuality to an extent. When um, did that decriminalisation, apart from the adultery issue, finally um, disappear in English law? It took a long, uh, I mean, in 1967, the law decriminalised homosexuality for people over 21 in private and that was not really what in private meant wasn't really defined uh, and so uh, there, there was a lot of um 
misunderstanding, a lot of persecution by the police who wanted to continue uh, arresting gay people, like, you know, if, if they were having sex outside somewhere, uh, that, then that was still illegal. Uh, if there were more than two people present, uh, they, then they could be arrested for that. So the, the persecution went on. And it took a long time and a lot of parliamentary uh, effort to bring the age of consent into uh, equality. So, you know, for, for, for straight people, the age of consent was 16. For gay people, it was 21. Eventually, after a lot of campaigning, a lot of agitation, it was brought down to 18. Uh, and still it wasn't equality. So we, we were reluctant to accept that because... You know, we, we were second-class citizens again. We were different. Um, and so the com the campaign continued until eventually the age of consent was equalised and we were all uh, 16. Now, talking of your, your long history of campaigning, um, when did you start campaigning with uh, the National Secular Society and what motivated you to join the NSS? Well, I'd, I'd noticed over a long period that that religion was was almost entirely responsible for the opposition to gay rights. All the the uh, agitation was either done by religious groups or people purporting to come from a religious perspective. The religious uh, MPs in Parliament were, you know, very aggressive, and uh, I, I thought, well, you know, why why would I tolerate that? Why would I want to be part of an organization that wanted to uh, deprive me of my human rights. But beyond that, I also had uh, become a sort of disillusioned, if you like, with religion and its r ridiculous claims. Um, so I, I was an atheist to start with, and, and when I saw the uh, the way that religion was trying very hard at every opportunity to uh, retard gay rights, uh, I, I thought the time had come to uh, stand in opposition to that. Are we talking specifically the Church of England or Catholicism as well, or other religions? Every religion. There wasn't a, a single religion that I heard of that, that wasn't opposed to gay rights to some extent. And yes, there were people who were lib on the liberal end of all of these things that, that would say, yes, that's OK, we, we're not opposed to you. But, you know, in the central doc doctrines and, you know, the, the hierarchy of the all these religions, the there was there was a hostility to gay rights. And uh, I felt that I had to oppose that in some way. And when I joined the NSS, it was very much an atheistic organization. Um, it was still in the Charles Bradlaugh arena of, you know, uh, being anti-religion. And that suited me fine uh, because it was from that platform that I could re respond to some of these uh, initiatives by religion uh, to, to put gay rights back in the closet. Do you have any examples of specific religious opponents or specific moves that um, any of these religious groups made that were particularly egregious? Yeah, I mean, during the uh, the uh, parliamentary debates on gay marriage and uh, the the thing that that preceded it, the civil partnerships in Parliament, the Church of England and the the the, the bench of bishops tried desperately to stop that getting through, to stop Parliament giving gay people even um, an inferior version of, of uh, recognition of their uh, relationships. Uh, later on, they tried to claim that, oh, no, we thought when, when the gay marriage debate came up, they thought they claimed that, uh, oh, we'd never opposed civil partnerships, but... Um, we, we do oppose gay marriage. We thought civil partnerships are okay, but that's rewriting history. If you go back and look at the debates, the, the bench of bishops were dreadfully opposed to, to civil partnerships when they were being brought forward. What, what were their reasons for opposing civil partnerships? Well, of course, they thought it undermined the, the concept of marriage. They thought that marriage was for heterosexuals, for men and women, for the purposes of procreation. Uh, and they didn't think that, that gay people uh, were entitled to that. And by giving gay people any form of recognition in their relationships, any legal recognition, it, in their eyes, undermined the whole concept of marriage.
As far as LGBT equality in the UK specifically today is concerned, um, we've got two different things. On the one hand, we've got legal equality, and on the other hand, we've got um, social attitudes and the attitudes of religious groups. In terms of legal equality, are LGBT rights there? Have, have they achieved full equality under UK law? When I look back to when I started and where we are now, I, I would say that we, we, we are more or less there. There are, you know, tiny, tiny little loopholes that need to be closed, but they, they don't amount to a great deal. And I think, uh, you know, we, are, we more or less have equality now. Um, and I, I don't think there's a great deal more to do. Uh, I'm sure that Peter Tatchell will tell you differently. Uh, but I think that you know, from my perspective, we have achieved legal equality. What we've got to do now is stop it being pushed back by the attempts of uh, organisations like the Vatican and the Church of England. Just on the subject of Peter Tetchell, because you've um, occasionally crossed paths during your, your long years of campaigning. Um, do you have any specific uh, memories of campaigning with him? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we <laughs> He once organised a protest uh in Westminster, there was a rule that you you could not have a demonstration within, I don't know, was it a mile of Parliament or something while it was sitting? Uh, and so Peter decided that he would uh, have a, a demonstration within that mile uh, so that uh, he, he was protesting about the right to demonstrate and, and to tell Parliament what he thought about things. So uh, we all turned up uh, and lay down within the the one mile radius of parliament and the the police had been warned about this and they were there with all their um, their black mariahs and we were all arrested and and loaded into these black mariahs and and carted off to the police station and put in cells and this was the very first time i'd ever ever been arrested or had dealing to the police and I'd certainly never seen the inside of a police cell before. And I was banged up with Derek Jarman, the famous film director, and he was very reassuring because I was I was actually quite scared. And he said, Oh don't worry, they'll just give you a caution. You'll be you'll be home before the day's out. And he was right, of course. It was just um you know, the police had to go through the motions and we had to go through the motions. Uh and that's one of the memories I have of campaigning with Peter. Just a couple more questions. I mean, so as far as you're concerned, is religion or are religions still the biggest ideological opponents in the world to LGBT equality? Yes. Uh, if not directly, uh, then through religious influence in politics. Uh, you see the, the Vatican pushing constantly they they will tell you that no we don't we don't try we don't interfere in politics at all but of course they do all the time and they they their representatives in parliaments all around the world are um, trying to carry out the vatican's uh, agenda so yes uh, politics and religion are when they combine are absolutely lethal for gay rights and if you look at the uh, politics of Hungary and Poland at the moment, you see that uh, th although they're populist in the sense that you know they will they will say and do anything that will get them votes, they've identified gay people and gay rights as an unpopular minority which can be exploited for electoral gain. And of course, they can use the Catholic Church as justification for that, saying, "Oh, this is a Christian nation." And, uh, you know, the church tells us that homosexuality is unacceptable. And so, you know, th that gives them the right and the opportunity to persecute gay people for electoral uh, advantage. So uh, I, I think that religion really is a, still a very, very strong opponent of gay rights. And in some places, it's becoming more so. It's becoming much more aggressive. So I think we, we have to be careful about becoming complacent and imagining that it couldn't happen here, uh, because I think it probably could. A final question. Is it possible to be religious and gay, in your view? Well, you can, and a lot of people are. Uh, I think that you know, being religious or, or having a faith is a, a little bit different to being part of an organised religion, because 
I think that gay people who are attached to organized religion, like Catholicism, uh, are mad, basically, because why would you want to support an organization that hates you? I never, ever understood that. And yet, as we know from, from uh, long experience, the Catholic Church is packed with gay people in the hierarchy. And some of the worst homophobes turn out in the end to be gay themselves. And that's also very apparent amongst the evangelical nations in America, uh, where or the evangelical states, I should say, where some of the highest profile televangelists have all been caught out in gay situations that they would prefer not to have been. So there's a sort of contradiction there, ideological contradiction. There is a contradiction. I think that uh, religion can pervert people's minds. It can it can drive them to such a degree of self hatred that they actually want to damage uh, other gay people. So uh, you know, the, the, it's a very uh, difficult relationship between homosexuality and religion for some people. Uh, I, I feel very sorry when people are, are, are driven to self hatred by a conflict with that and religious faith. Terry Sanderson, thank you very much. This episode was produced by the National Secular Society, all rights reserved. The views expressed by contributors do not necessarily represent those of the NSS. You can access the show notes and subscriber information for this and all our episodes at secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. For feedback, comments and suggestions, please email podcast at secularism.org.uk. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a positive review wherever you can. Thanks for listening and I hope you can join us next time.